Hello, this is Mr. Field, and this is my video on the reactivity of metals. Now, before you watch this video, make sure you're comfortable and confident on the stuff on forming ions, and particularly the formulas of polyatomic ions, bonding models, and especially the stuff to do with metallic bonding, the reactions of acids and bases, and then finally, how to balance the chemical equations. I've got videos on all of those things earlier on in this playlist. So in this video, we're going to look at um, recapping our knowledge of metals. Then we'll look at the reactivity series, um, how the reactivity series links to the formation of ions. We'll look at the reaction of metals with cold water, then with steam, then their reaction with acids. And finally, we'll look at the idea of a displacement reaction. So let's quickly recap our knowledge of metals. Now, in terms of their properties, remember properties is the scientific word for characteristics. So in terms of the properties of metals, they are all shiny. They're nearly all solid um, at room temperature, except for mercury, which is the one that is liquid. Um, they have high melting points, typically in the high hundreds to the thousands of degrees Celsius, um, although a few do melt at much lower temperatures than that. They are malleable, which means that if you bend them or hit them, they will bend rather than snapping or shattering. Um, they are good electrical and thermal conductors, which means that electricity and heat can pass through them pretty easily. Now, on the periodic table, we find metals towards the left. So if you picture a line between boron and aluminium here, um, between boron and aluminium, and sort of step that line down, everything to the left of that line are metals, and all the elements to the right of it plus hydrogen are the non-metals okay now so what you can see there is about 85 or so percent of the elements are actually metals rather than non-metals now in terms of their bonding we describe the bonding in metals as a lattice that is a 3d grid of metal cations remember those are positive ions surrounded by a cloud of delocalized electrons and it's the attraction between those positive cations and the negative electrons that forms the bond so if we if we were to draw an atom like this okay there's my atom and we were to imagine you know an electron shell around it with a couple of electrons in it okay when it's bonded in a metal you end up with just the nucleus on its own with a positive charge and the electrons can just move freely wherever the hell they like and that's what you can see in this uh, in this animated gif here you can see the way the electrons are just kind of moving around freely rather than orbiting a single atom and that's why elect uh, metals can conduct electricity because those electrons are free to move okay so let's look at something new the reactivity series now the idea of reactivity tells us how readily a substance takes part in chemical reactions for that word readily you might you might want to think about easily so um, more reactive substances take part in a wider range of reactions and they tend to react more quickly as well so if we look at something like potassium here this is a very reactive metal you can see that when we've dropped it in some water it's burst into purple flame and it's spitting out all these sparks as well that's a really reactive metal if we take something a bit less reactive like iron and drop that in some water it will react but it's not exactly going to spark and bubble and explode and stuff it is just going to slowly rust over the course of months if not years so it does react but it's much much slower if we take something like gold so this this is a a roman uh, gold coin this is probably over 2000 years old and look it looks brand new it you know it hasn't rusted at all hasn't reacted nothing's happened to it because that's super unreactive which leads us to the idea of the reactivity series, which is a list of metals in order from most to least reactive. Um, so we can see the potassium right here at the top. That's our most reactive metal. We can see our iron somewhere sort of towards the middle of the reactivity series. And then right down here at the bottom, we've got our gold, which is our least reactive metal. And we've got the others in order. So the most reactive is potassium, then sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, then zinc, and iron, copper, silver, and gold. Now, you'll notice that we've got carbon and hydrogen in there as well. They're in brackets in red because they're not actually metals, but we they do have their own reactivity, and we do talk about these a lot in the context of metals. So just be aware that they will appear in the reactivity series, but 
even though they're not actually metals. Um, and the last thing to note is that you do not need to memorize this. If you're asked anything about the reactivity series in an Edexcel GCSE exam question, they will give you a copy of the reactivity series for you to use. So don't waste your time trying to memorize it. Although it is helpful to know some basics, like the idea that potassium is right up there at the top and gold is right down here at the bottom. Okay, so let's look at how metal reactivity links to the formation of ions. Okay, so whenever metals react, they lose their outer shell electrons to form positive ions in all reactions of metals. That's the way they react. They form positive ions. Remember, we call positive ions cations. Remember, cations are positive. So if we look at some example reactions. We'll look at how three different metals react with oxygen to form an oxide. So the first one is potassium reacting with oxygen to form potassium oxide. Then we'll look at magnesium reacting with oxygen to form magnesium oxide. And finally, zinc reacting with oxygen to form zinc oxide. Now, in all of these cases, if we look at just what's happening to the metal, we'll ignore the oxygen because that's the same in each case. But just focus on what's happening to the metal. In the first one, Potassium atoms, K, lose electrons to become K+. Plus. Okay. In the magnesium oxide example, magnesium atoms lose two electrons to become Mg2 plus ions. And equally, in the last one, the zinc ions lose two electrons to become zinc 2 plus ions. And so what we're saying is because potassium is the most reactive, this one is the easiest to happen. This process of forming ions is easiest for potassium. If we look at the zinc, which is the least reactive of, the, of these metals, okay, this process of forming ions is the hardest. Zinc holds onto its le electrons more strongly than the potassium, therefore it is less reactive. So what we can say then is that more reactive metals are more reactive because they are easier to ionize. So let's look at the reaction of metals with cold water or just any liquid water. It doesn't have to specifically be cold, but just liquid water. OK, now so the top three metals in the reactivity series, which is potassium, sodium and calcium, are so reactive that they will react with cold water to make a metal hydroxide and hydrogen. So let's look at some examples of that. The first one is going to be potassium. So potassium reacting with water will make potassium hydroxide and hydrogen and we can see that happening here this reaction happens really vigorously you can see it actually catches fire straight away if you notice look we care if you can see the metal zipping around on the surface and some bubbles of hydrogen gas being produced as well okay our next one will react a bit more slowly is sodium now sodium reacting with water will make sodium hydroxide this time and again it makes the hydrogen and lastly calcium reacting with water will make calcium hydroxide and hydrogen. So you can see in every case we've got a very similar equation, it's just we're changing what the hydroxide is depending on the metal. Now if we look at the symbol equations for these, for the potassium we'll have two K's for potassium reacting with two H2O's to make two KOH. Now why is it KOH? Well potassium's in group one with one electron in the outer shell which it will lose to make a K plus ion. You need to know that hydroxide is the OH minus ion. One positive and one negative will cancel out to give you KOH as our balanced formula. And then lastly, we've got the H2 for hydrogen. Remember, it's H2, not just H. Um, and once you've got all the formulas, the balancing works itself out, provided you're confident with that stuff. The next one we're going to look at is sodium reacting with water. And this time, sodium is Na. And it's going to react with H2O to make NaOH. That's the sodium hydroxide. Again, why is that? Well, sodium's in group one, one electron in the outer shell. It will lose that electron to form a one plus ion, Na plus. And hydroxide is OH minus. So a single positive and a single negative will cancel out to leave you with that NaOH formula. And again, we've got our H2 for hydrogen. In terms of the balancing, once you've got the formulas, the balancing will work itself out. Um, check my previous video on balancing equations if you're not confident with that. And lastly, for the um, calcium, calcium C8, um, water H2O again, calcium hydroxide, this time it's CaOH2. How come? Well, calcium's in group two, so it has two electrons in the outer shell. 
it will lose them both to form a 2 plus ion. Hydroxide just has a single negative charge, OH minus. So we need a second hydroxide ion, another OH minus, to give us two negatives to cancel out the two positives. Therefore, the two in CaOH2. And also, don't forget the hydrogen. OK, so some metals won't react with cold water, but they will react with steam. Remember, steam is um, water, gas. You might also call it water vapour as well, but not, not room temperature water vapour. It needs to be hot water vapour, i.e. steam, for it to actually get be, be enough to react. Now, the metals that do this are magnesium, aluminium, zinc and iron. So they won't react with cold water, but they do react with steam. And when they do that, rather than making a hydroxide, they make an oxide and also hydrogen gas as well. So, for example, magnesium will react with steam to make magnesium oxide and hydrogen. And we can see that reaction happening here. So in this reaction, there's some mineral wool soaked in water and that gets heated to make steam. We've got so our water is coming from there. We've got a little lump of magnesium ribbon here. Okay? And once the reaction gets hot enough and there's enough steam, you can see all this light being given off as the reaction really kicks off and makes all that magnesium oxide. And you can see over here that flame coming out the end. That is the hydrogen gas produced that is burning off. Now, a similar thing, but a bit slower, happens when iron reacts with steam and this time it will make iron 3 oxide, I'll talk more about that in a second, and hydrogen. So let's look at the equations for this. Now magnesium, Mg, nice and easy. Water, H2O, also nice and easy. But what about the formula? It's going to be MgO. Why is it MgO? Well magnesium is group 2, so it will lose two electrons to form two plus ions. Oxygen, oxide is from oxygen, that is group 6, six electrons in the outer shell. It gains two to form two minus ions. So a two plus ion and a two negative ion, we've got equal numbers of opposite charges. So just one of each will cancel out and that gives us the MgO. And also the hydrogen again. And don't forget it's H2, not just H. What about this time for the next one with the iron? Well, iron is one of our annoying um, symbols that is actually Fe rather than um, I or something. And that's because it comes from the Latin ferrum. Um, it reacts with steam. Um, H2O and this time it's going to make Fe2O3 that's the iron oxide but why the hell is it that well let's start with iron now this Roman numeral 3 means 3 plus so we know our iron is Fe3 plus we've just seen that oxide is O2 minus so we don't have enough negative charges to cancel out the three positives so we add another one on we, we stick a second one in so now we've got four negative charges and three positives. So actually now we've got too much negative charge. So we add another Fe3 plus like that. So now we've got a total of six positives. Now we don't have enough oxide, uh, enough negatives again. So if we add a third oxide in, that gives us a total of two, four, six negatives to cancel out our three, six positives. Therefore, Fe2O3. And again, we make the hydrogen as well. Lastly, we've got a few metals, um, copper, silver and gold, which are so unreactive that they don't react with water at all, whether it's um, steam or liquid. OK, so now we're going to look at the reaction of metals with dilute acids. Um, we're talking dilute hydrochloric sulfuric acid or nitric acid. Um, by dilute, we mean kind of uh, watered down. Um, we don't want anything that is too concentrated and too strong because then actually some different reactions can happen as well. Now, what we'll see is that metals that are above hydrogen in the reactivity series will react with acids to produce a salt and hydrogen gas. Now, we've got hydrogen here on the reactivity series. Remember, it's not a metal, but we still put it on the reactivity series. So potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc and iron will all react with acids because they are more reactive than hydrogen whereas copper silver and gold will not react with dilute acids because they're less reactive than hydrogen so let's look at some example reactions our first one is calcium this will react with hydrochloric acid to make calcium chloride remember hydrochloric acid makes chloride salts and hydrogen I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can check out my pre previous videos on the reactions of acids um, from the acids and uh, bases unit. 
uh, where we're going to look more depth on that. Um, so this will be CA plus HCl making, uh, sorry, 2HCl uh, making CaCl2 and H2. Alternatively, we might have iron um, reacting with nitric acid to make iron 3 nitrate and hydrogen. So that would be 2 Fe's reacting with 6 HNO3's to make 2 FeNO3 in brackets 3 and 3 H2's. And our last reaction uh, example is sodium. This might react with sulfuric acid to make sodium sulfate. Remember, sulfuric acid makes sulfate salts and hydrogen as well. So we can have Na, 2Na plus H2SO4 making Na2SO4 and H2. Again, I won't go into depth on that, but do check out the reactions of acids videos that I, uh, a few lessons uh, earlier where you can go into detail on that. Now, our last reaction we're going to look at is displacement reactions. Now, a displacement reaction is when a more reactive metal displaces a less reactive metal from a compound. Now, this word displace means something like takes the place of. Okay. Now, this only works when the more reactive metal is an element and the less reactive metal is in the compound. So let's look at a couple of examples where this works, first of all. We might have, say, iron oxide and carbon, making carbon dioxide and iron. Now, this works because if we look where carbon and iron are, carbon is more reactive and iron is less reactive. So carbon can displace the iron from the iron oxide. It takes its place to form the carbon dioxide. Similarly, aluminium and copper chloride. Now, aluminium, if we look here, aluminium's up here, and um, copper is down here. So aluminium is more reactive, and copper is less reactive. So again, because the more reactive metal is the element on its own, it can displace the less reactive metal from the compound to make aluminium chloride and copper. So it's just the aluminium and the copper are trading places. That's what displace means. The aluminium takes the place of the, alum, of the um, copper from the copper chloride. Some examples that don't work, let's say we had copper and zinc nitrate. Well, copper is down here and zinc is up here. So copper is less reactive and zinc is more reactive. So this doesn't work because copper is less reactive and a less reactive metal cannot displace a more reactive metal from a compound. If we did want to displace the zinc, we would need one of these guys here, anything that is more reactive than the zinc. Um, equally, sodium oxide re will not react with magnesium for the same reason. We've got sodium up here and we've got magnesium down here. So sodium is um, more reactive than the magnesium and the magnesium is less reactive than the sodium. So again, the less reactive metal cannot displace a more reactive metal from a compound. So because of that, no reactions will happen. Okay, so that's it for the end. Uh, thank you as always for listening and well done if you got this far.